any seven Eastern time, so we can get started any time. Usually, when I do office hours at Georgia Tech, I wait a couple of minutes, uh, you know, for people coming late. But I think at this in this case, we probably shouldn't. Uh, we have let's see, oh, 13 viewers. Can people see me? I don't know if uh, stream ch chat. I haven't done Twitch, guys. Okay, so my bad if uh, I look like an old person. Maybe I'm getting old. Oh, Joseph is there. That's awesome. Nice setup. Yeah, and I never used it for uh, Twitch, believe it or not. Uh, this is the first time I use this, way. usually for uh, office hours uh, back in the day. Uh, but yeah, I have not used uh, Twitch. Twitch? Uh, I don't know how you pronounce this one. Twitch. Twitch. So, yeah, very nice that you're here, uh, Joseph. I, 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 I'm... I'm flatter because <laughs> uh, it's probably very late yeah you're right but we're gonna try to make your time worth uh you know all this time worth it Let's see and nine viewers that's probably bad because uh we just started with 16 anyways in any case we're gonna we're gonna get started actually uh so what i wanted to do today um is actually go over and let me uh switch to uh my tablet well, actually, so uh, what I wanted to do is go over chapter nine of my book. Um, I know that uh, I think Manning is going to make available the chapter during the stream. So if uh, I mean, if, if you have the MEEP, then go ahead and download the PDF. I'm actually going to be sharing my screen and showing a little bit of, uh, a little bit of the PDF as well. Uh, but um, I'm not so sure how or where, you know, may maybe there are some links over there. Try to find it. Uh, but I think that uh, Manning is making chapter nine available uh, for the stream. And uh, so what I encourage you guys, what book is that? Oh, a really good question. Okay, so uh, so my name is Miguel Morales. Uh, I'm the author of Grokking Deep Reinforcement Learning. Uh, I'm a uh, software engineer. I do research in reinforcement learning at uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, Missiles and Fire Control Autonomous Systems. I'm also a part-time instructional associate at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, and recent, I mean, I, I also recorded some uh, actor critic lectures for Udacity. Uh, very happy to have done that. Uh, great. I, 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 I'm, I'm myself a Udacity grad from multiple uh, nano degrees, and, and I felt that that was kind of like going full circle and giving back to, to that uh, community and company. And uh, mo recently, um, I, I authored uh, this book, uh, Grokking Deep Reinforcement Learning. And uh, the book is meant, is designed to help people go from, you know, a little bit of machine learning experience to here, state-of-the-art uh, deep, reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay, now I'm not saying that, <laughs> you know, the book is going to take you to state-of-the-art research, uh, not at all. But uh, in part-time streaming, oh, that's great. Okay, uh, well, so hopefully you like and you let me know how 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 it was, whether the, the stream had some quality or not. Um, but yeah, so uh, the book is designed to take people with a little bit of background in machine learning. You don't have to have much, but at least something to kind of understand what is you know what is supervised learning. I still try to go and do some refresher before getting into reinforcement learning, but the approach I take is to try to get folks going into uh, the book uh, and, and then through everything related to reinforcement learning that is not necessarily machine learning or supervised learning, what most people uh, think of um, uh, machine learning, which, which is really supervised learning, most, most, be, most folks out there. Uh, and then little by little give you uh, the insight as to how to use supervised learning techniques uh, to solve reinforcement learning problems. Okay, so, and I think the book is pretty decent, uh, does a pretty good job, I think, uh, <laughs> and you know, it might sound silly that, that I'm saying that the book I wrote, uh, right, is, is okay, but I, trust me, if I, if I said it's because I really put a lot of effort to try to help people go from, uh, you know, because when I had to learn reinforcement learning, I had so many questions, and the questions were like all over the place. They were there, uh, but you had to, you know, watch 
hundreds of videos of this lecture and this other person and this other person, plus, you know, read the books, plus read the papers, plus, and there's so much misinformation as well. So what I try to do is condense all of that stuff and put it in the same, in the same resource so that you guys can, you know, hopefully uh, see it from my lens, uh, which I, I try to make it as clear and detailed as possible uh, for, your, for your benefit. All right, I see, uh, yeah, excited for these. Answer a lot of my questions and step. Blah, blah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the, yeah, for, uh, uh, you know, reviewers and also uh, Meep supporters, early folks that uh, purchased the book. I mean, I, I, I'm so grateful because, you know, three years projects is, is really rough. <laughs> Trust me, when you have two little kids and two other jobs, uh, it's, it's hard. But I can tell you that Whenever I went back and look at people actually supporting the book, I, I'm like, okay, that's what really kept me, you know, plowing through and trying to clarify things and rewrite things and so on. So hopefully you guys have benefit from it. And, uh, you know, if you're still thinking about it, go ahead and grab the chapter. We're going to go over chapter nine today. Actually, only one section of chapter nine. I'm going to show a little bit of code, but, you know, I thought <clears throat> mo I'd rather show you how to use my notebooks than show you my, oh, look how cool I am and I'm gonna be coding here live. Because, you know, first it would take me time to actually, you know, figure out what to uh, code live. And I'd rather kind of explain it, show you where to get the code, and then so that you can actually follow along and also, uh, you know, keep going. Because my, my point and my, I, I, what I hope is that people learning this thing uh, not just read the book and go like, oh, I'm satisfied, but that, that actually teases you into go beyond that book, okay? Because it, this is state-of-the-art today. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's, you know, it's still it's going to be st uh, state-of-the-art, you know, by the end of the year. Well, I don't know. With COVID, I don't know if there's going to be so many innovation or what, what's going to happen there, but uh, yeah. So with that, uh, let's get started. I, let's see. So we have the comments in there. I think I can handle this. It seems kind of straightforward uh, all right so let's see tablet and then I can change there so hopefully you guys can see now my tablet okay so <clears throat> um, let's see did I close that I did it there it is all right so we're gonna go over this book okay this chapter I'm sorry specifically and what I want you to see is here, uh, in the, the, the intro, and I make all these things, uh, all these things make sense to me, at least, you know, to me. I made them, I put them in there for a reason, okay? Um, DQN, the way I see it, is these guys were sitting around one day and thought, how can we make the problem of reinforcement learning look like a supervised learning problem? Because we have so many different techniques. Uh, are ready to, you know, uh, you want to train a classifier to classify cats. We have that. And, you know, there are theoretical things proven. Everything is beautiful. Everything is shiny. Uh, everything is great. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but, uh, so, for reinforcement learning, the problem is a completely different problem. And I want you to get the intuition as to what is different between reinforcement learning and, I'm going to say, supervised learning. Okay, the one thing, okay, so there are a couple of things there, but um, let's see. So I'm gonna tell you like, um, first like more intuitive, and then we're gonna go into how they actually, so we can follow the book then, and, and go more precisely as to what, I, what is that call. But if you think about how it's done with supervised learning, uh, what you commonly have is a bunch of samples, you know, pictures of little cats. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to draw too much, but those are, those are my samples. Those are a bunch of little cats in there, right? <clears throat> and notice something. You have all these pictures in advance, okay? You have the control of the data. So you, you have the control of the data. You also going to, you know exactly what's a cat and what's not. So the rules of the games are you're going to tell your, your algorithms, tra remember, we're training a supervised learning model. So you're s giving supervision to the, to, the, to the model. You're saying, that's a cat, that's a cat, you know, that's, you know, that's something else. That's not a cat, and so on, right? That's one thing. You have control of the data, 
It's given in advance to you, and you can do anything you want with it. The other thing that is commonly uh, seen in supervised learning is that the data is also diverse. So instead of having a, uh, uh, so you can imagine a picture of the same cat, you know, and, and then you taping, taking pictures of the same cat all over the place, just going around in circles, taking millions of pictures of your cat, Fifi, right? No, it's not cool. You need data that is diverse, that is independent is the word, but we'll, we'll get into the words in, in just a second. All right, so that's one thing is that is really, you know, different cats. It's not the same cat. One is red, one is green. That's my depiction of different cats. And that's enough. All right. So this is supervised learning. In reinforcement learning, is like you just can't do that. Reinforcement learning is trying to model online learning. You're learning from, you know, this video stream. You can't shuffle me right now. Sorry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I come online. The data, the stream of data comes into your sen sensory uh, things, um, eyes, ears, and so on, um, online. So you don't get control of that. You, you, you get control of how you learn these data, right? You can record the video, learn later. You can go to bed later and be like, okay, so I kind of I kind of understand what he meant and things like that and kind of replay that in your head, but you don't have control on how the, the data comes. And also it's not really that diverse because um, you know, what I'm saying right now has a very particular relationship in sequence, right? So I'm saying something, I'm gonna flow the whole you know, teaching uh, in a particular way. You don't get to pick uh, whether, well, I guess you get to pick if you want to switch videos, right? But other than that, you don't get to pick uh, for, for this particular stream. So the data in this case, and I like to do it like this, ST, um, ST plus one, and this is, this represents states plus two and so on. Uh, and then S at time T, which will be the last one. This is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, this guy over here, depends on this guy, right? So if you're driving a car and you're turning left, uh, you know that what you're gonna see the next step depends on what you're, what, where you are at this moment and actually something over here, like a little action, right? In that case will be cap, action, right? So that is all, there's all a lot of correlation in there, okay? So that's the main difference, all right? So now we're gonna switch real quick. Any questions so far? By the way, I usually, Hey, welcome to the stream. Yeah, that's that's it, Manning. Uh, any questions so far? Any comments so far? <clears throat> I'm gonna take that as a, we're getting the hang of it, of this. Uh, let's see, Manning, how's it going? Okay, excellent. <clears throat> All right, so what I just said is basically uh, there, there are actually words for this, okay? And, you know, in my, the, the book we have there, uh, this page over here, um, I, I actually, so I'm gonna go to the highlights, basically. You can read this in your own time. But to me, the highlight is this. So the data is not independent and identically distributed. That's a reality of, of uh, online learning, right? When you do a supervised learning, the assumption in the data is independent, meaning that one sample, one cat is not the same cat as the other cat and the other and so on. There are ways to go around that, but you know, uh, so like the standard uh, supervised learning does not uh, work well if you do it that way. Okay, so independent in that sense, and also identically distributed means that uh, you, you know, because you receive the data set in advance, you get to shuffle it, right? That's basically what you do every time. You get you get a data set, you shuffle it, and then you split it and so on. So it's distributed identically, but you know in reinforcement learning is not the case. In reinforcement learning, uh, what what you do today, so I don't, I cannot just teleport all of a sudden and be somewhere around the world. It just doesn't happen that way. Learning online uh, has the, uh, a, a distribution that is not identically distributed. Uh, today, I'm gonna experience something, and a little later, I'm gonna experience something else, and then later at night, and then tomorrow, and so on. So there is some, uh, some uh, you know, sequential nature there 
that is very unique uh, to online learning, and is you know it's it's very very cool actually to to have that uh, challenge. So I would say those two things, right? So this guy, and then this guy. Um, so that would be my the first you know kind of issue that we're trying to solve. Remember now, let me let me. Uh, rewind a little bit. We're trying to see what are the differences between supervised learning and reinforcement learning to see, to try to come up with an algorithm. We're not going to come up with it, but we're going to discover it that way. Um, that uh, basically tries to make the uh, reinforcement learning problem look like supervised learning to the training model. Okay, that's the whole uh, goal that we're trying to get to uh, right now. So the second thing is that this is a little harder to kind of interpret, but but we can go into it. Uh, is that uh, let's see where? Okay, there it is. Uh, is that in supervised learning? And I guess I can use the highlighter, right? Supervised learning, the targets I use for uh, is the targets used for training are fixed values on your data set. Um, you know, you have the same data set. You you're gonna say this is my training data. This is my validation. This is my test. You grab batches from this from the shuffle um, data set, uh, and the the data set's not going to change. You, you keep doing that over and over and over and over and over and over, and then you are going to try to find that optimal, right? Well, reinforcement learning that's not the case, right? Because if you think about it, um, you know, if you want to be like a great soccer player, uh, you start very early. You start, you know, passing the ball and so on and you are really bad at it. You really do not see things that you can, that a professional can see, okay? So things are changing all the time. Things are, you're, you're, when you are learning, what you are using for learning is changing. Your experiences are gonna change every single time step, okay? So that is that. Let's see, what else do I have here? And, uh, okay, so. So yeah, so here, so we, so we optimize, this, this part I think is the key here. We optimize the, the, the approximate value function and therefore shame the, cha the, the shape of the function. That is possibly the entire value function, which means that the targets change as well. Now, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but there is something called as TD uh, versus uh, Monte Carlo. If you know, if you don't know very much like what that, you know, I explained in an earlier chapter, so highly recommend you go and check that out because even though it's kind of like uh, very, uh, how do you say, like um, uh, basic stuff or not basic, I, fundamental stuff, a lot of people, you know, are very, uh, they just want to learn like the state of the art. Uh, but if you don't go through that process, then the state of the art, this really doesn't make much sense. But this is true for this guy over here because uh, there are two ways of, um, there, let's see, should I explain this real quick? Yeah, I think we, we can actually explain it when it, when it comes a little later, we're, we're going to have the equation and uh, in there, I might be able to explain the difference between these two. Uh, when we get to the equation, if I don't explain the difference between TD and Monte Carlo, let me know because I think that's important to get the distinction to understand what it means that this section otherwise may not make much sense, that the targets change as well. What do you mean there? Uh, what are you talking about? I, I think I can help with that uh, when we get to the, to the equations. All right. So, um, all right. So here is a kind of, you know, a little uh, drawing that, that says, hey, you know, so... This is, you can imagine this black uh, line being the value function, having a particular shape. And then so you get the value of, of the next state uh, to calculate the value of the current state. You use that as an estimate for future, what you're gonna get in the, in the future, right? So, but you can see here, what I'm trying to say is like the red is really what's going to happen after an update. So all of a sudden, every update, you're changing, changing the shape of your function, right? And then what's gonna happen is immediately after you make that update, you know, here is what I'm trying to, to uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that that point, which is the value of the next state, it's already here, it already changed. It's no longer valid. I probably shouldn't say valid because I, I think that has a mathematical 
uh, meaning, but I meant it's really not correct. It's no longer accurate, okay? So th that's the figure uh, representing that. Uh, let's see. So, okay. So again, the two problems, the targets that we're using for training are not stationary the way that supervised learning methods um, have it. So supervised learning methods, remember, you have the data set, you shuffle it, and then you, the, the kind of where you're going is the same thing from the beginning to the end of training. In reinforcement learning, where you're going changes a little bit at a time. As you get better and better and better, there's new, new, uh, a new policy. The new policy creates new data. The new data creates new estimates. The new estimates create, then the new, uh, value function, a new value function, here's a new policy, and so on, and that cycle repeats and repeats and repeats, and, um, and uh, oh, I see, um, repeats, repeats, and, and then, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, non-stationarity of the targets right there. And the second thing that we talked about, actually, which was the first thing, is that the uh, data is not IID, identically distributed, uh, independent and identically distributed, okay? So how do we fix this, these two problems? Um, any ideas? Folks read already? It's like I, I need to get used to streaming is a little bit different because I usually in uh, office hours for Georgia Tech, I get to actually ask questions and I just wait until people kind of like get back to me. And it doesn't seem that this could work uh, nicely for this kind of stream. All right, just gonna keep going. All right, so there are actually two techniques. Uh, well, a couple of uh, ways that we can make this better. You know, reality is online learning is just a different animal and we should be trying to make online learning uh, look like uh, supervised learning. That's not, that's, not the, uh, that's not a satisfying solution, but for this, uh, particular algorithm is a good, you know, way to, you know, actually it was one of the first ones, right? Uh, 2013, 2015, uh, two papers, one in 2013, one in 2015, and, you know, it actually started a bunch of uh, uh, contributions, right? I mean, can you think, 2015, is that only that five years ago? My goodness. So many papers have come after that, and, you know, so much, like, good research uh, is out now, which is, you know, is really, really good. All right, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is... All right, so the use of target networks. Let's see. Okay. So the use of target networks. Okay, the number one uh, addition to uh, DQN is the use of tar target networks. A target network is it's just, uh, it's just a copy of your network, the same network that you're training that states that, that, that stays frozen for a couple of steps so that uh, basically the, uh, the training of the online network uh, basically try, uses uh, the, the, the frozen values of the target network uh, for many steps before that, um, that uh, um, target network uh, the weights of that target network actually change again, okay? So I want to be very clear with that because it's a little confusing. Um, so, but, you know, here the little, the little drawing here may help you, um, may help you kind of understand what I meant. All right, so you can imagine here, this is your target, right? This is, this is in a, in a, in a world without a target, target network. Uh, the approximation would do something like that, so, right? So it's gonna go here, it's gonna go here, it's gonna go here, and so on, right? But the target really doesn't stay there. In supervised learning, it does, but in reinforcement learning, the target actually is jumping because, you know, the, the, the value function gets better. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to, <laughs> uh, I need to explain the TD and Monte Carlo because otherwise you guys probably don't have a clue what I'm saying. Uh, so I realize that, all right? So. Let's very briefly go, uh, I'm gonna show you the equation. We're gonna go and explain in the whiteboard. Uh, and I want, I want people to make sure that they get the differences because um, it, it makes sense there. So the equation here for uh, training um, uh, a network is to use the reward that you experience plus 
this thing over here, which is basically, oh, look at that, it's fancy. Um, this thing over here, which is basically saying, um, approximate, give me an estimate of what's going to happen once I, I arrive to the next state and pretend that I'm gonna take the best action, the action with the maximum value, okay? And that takes me to, that takes me to here. Let's add one page real quick. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, yeah, this guy. All right, so in reinforcement learning, um, you can imagine a, a great world, okay? There's something happening in this great world. And you always start here. Here's a plus one. You know, here's a minus one. Um, you want to, let's say that you have a very specific policy. You're always going, or so you have a very specific policy, say like this, right? These are your actions usually. Uh, if you're here, you're going to go there. If you're here, you're going to do this and so on. See, so that's why I probably need to do more like, you know, streaming more often because then I could actually, you know, talk about the different problems and, you know, you know, you, you think like, what can I do in one hour? Uh, and I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of hard because I have no idea where, where people stand to actually help them get to the, to the next uh, level. But we'll give it a try. All right, so you want basically to know the value of this state. Let's say that you want to estimate that value. There are multiple ways to estimate this thing. One of them is called Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is the kind of like more straightforward, like in my head at least, uh, this is the way that I would do it uh, before I, I knew anything about reinforcement learning. Monte Carlo is drop the agent in there, drop the guy here, and let him run the policy. Let him run it for like a million times. It's fine. Just let her, let, let the agent go around the world, experience all of the things that needs to experience, and then you can average all of all of that experience. You can average, right? So let's say that the reward here is, uh, you know, zero, 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 and so on. Let's say. Um, let's say that it's actually 0 0.1 to make it a little bit more, uh, you know, representative of what I'm trying to describe um, and so on, right? So maybe there's something like that. You can imagine a world, right? That's Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, again, says, let that policy run for a long time and we're going to average all of the values saying we're good. We only care about the value of this guy for now. Uh, we're good. The other way to do it is what is called TD. Temporal difference, and that was, you know, kind of an introduction by Rich Sutton. Um, well, kind of. <laughs> that was uh, an algorithm introduced by by uh, Rich Sutton. Um, the the one thing with TD is the realization that um, you can experience one step and predict what's going to happen from here on, and then you can immediately update your policy. You don't have to let the policy run all the way until the agent either, you know, gets the plus one or minus one. Let's say that these are terminal. Let's say that the, the agent terminates. So the episode ends when he, once he reach, it, it reaches either this one or this one. Uh, sorry, I guess you cannot see my hand. It's say either this one or this one. Okay. That's when the agent ends the episode, right? So the, the, it's important to realize that you can, you can also estimate the values of every single step here, this guy, this guy, this guy, and so on. And then, so when you go and transition like this from here to here, you use the estimate, the estimate from this second state to basically estimate the value of this guy, which is a little weird. It's like saying, okay, well, you know, I made I made a million dollars last year, so I know that for the rest of my of my life, I'm gonna make ten million dollars. How do you do that? Like, why why would you? You know, it's uh, well, we can do it with days, right? So I make a million dollars in a day. I know that tomorrow I'm gonna make so much and so on. Um, it's a little contradicting to, or not contradicting. Uh, how do I say? Like, um, it's a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, when you do it early on, because your guesses are make uh, are incorrect, you know that are not right. Uh, you have no idea. You you're you know beginning your journey. 
You have no idea the true value of this guy or the true value of this guy and so on. So <clears throat> the interesting thing is that in the update equation, I'm talking about that this transition over here, and I probably need to use a different color now, this transition over here actually has a signal that is real, which is a reward. And then you're gonna calculate the value of that guy uh, using that reward plus, and, and probably shouldn't use the discounted value right now, plus the value of that next state, S prime. Uh, and when you see Q, that's you know uh, basically the same thing, just saying that the value and the action, given that the action is gonna be like a max here. But to simplify it, let me just say like that, what I'm saying is <clears throat> you use the value of a next state to calculate the value of um, the current state. Now, this is not a, an equation because I need, you know, obviously uh, the whole target, right? But, you know, uh, that's what we're doing there, okay? And then, so that's, that's the difference between Monte Carlo and TD. The problem in reinforcement learning and what I was t t telling you about the target network is that when you are approximating stuff, this guy over here is going to be changing every step because this guy over here is related to this guy over here. And that is just going to spiral around like crazy, diverge. And that's why there's so many unhappy people after they try to implement some reinforcement learning algorithm and say like, reinforcement learning doesn't work, this is terrible, I hate it, whatever, okay? The point is that it's usually uh, there's some gotchas in there that are not easy to follow. They're not, you don't have it in your head until you actually understand the details. Um, and so that's one of them just to be aware. Okay, let's see. How do you change? Okay, there it is. Cool. All right, so now we can go back into this. Aha, now I, I think you guys are going to understand better this section. What I'm saying here is that because that value function is tr being trained every step, you can expect this target over here. You can expect that thing that I was drawing in there. You can expect this guy over here to be moving like this. First goes here, then it goes here, then it changes here, and then it changes here. And it's just gonna keep switching back and forth. So the target is non-stationary, bad, bad, bad idea. All right, so your training is gonna actually try to go towards the target, right? So the training ideally would go here, then here, then you know, get closer and closer and then hit the target but it's gonna go, 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 and then this thing just change all of a sudden here, and the training just starts flipping back and forth, it's spiraling around, divergence. Oh, okay, end of the world. How do we solve it? All right, so a target network, what it does is to, you know, you have the two networks again, and one is gonna be producing those estimates that I talk about. Okay, let's see, how do, I need to get better at this of, uh, where is that other thing? Ah, oh, there it is. All right, <clears throat> so one, this guy is gonna be a target network. Let's put some other color. This guy is gonna be a target network. And this guy is gonna be training every single time, okay? So now your target is stationary for so many steps, right? Stationary, 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 boom, changes, okay? And then stationary, 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 boom, changes. And then you go like that, boom, 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 back and forth. Uh, well, back and forth, hopefully not back and forth, just, you know, little bit at a time I meant <laughs> uh, all right so all right so this is basically what I'm trying to describe here with the target network so that's I, I want you to grok that real like just put it in your head that's the reason why you have a, a target network you want the targets to look stationary now um, you, you can you know I like analogies uh, for teaching this kind of thing so that you get it into an intuitive level uh, imagine you know climbing a mountain right and then you say, I want to go to that high, the highest peak. Uh, you, so in reinforcement learning, what you're doing with the target network is putting, you know, stepping stones. Like, okay, I'm gonna go to that rock first, then I'm gonna go through that path, then I'm gonna go. Even if I go down, that's fine. I go a little down, and then I go back here, and so on, and then I climb it. You still have the goal that is going up to that, you know, peak all the way in the mountain, right? But what you don't want is to try to go straight to the mountain when you're you're not gonna be able, well, you know, it's, it's not as easy to, to go straight to the mountain. In this case, that's basically what we're doing with this target network. We're actually, you know, set, making the, 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 the approaching of the true target or the, the true uh, kind of optimum uh, value uh, a little bit at a time, 
right? We, we, we freeze the network, we solve that problem, then we, we update the network, we freeze it again, solve that next problem, and so on. Little by little, you accumulate all that uh, goodness in there. All right, so let's see. What else do we have in here? <clears throat> yeah, I guess I, you know, do say it here a little bit. They're sort of artificially creating uh, several small, small supervised learning problems presented sequentially to our agent, to the agent. That's basically what you're doing by doing that, the target network. A little problem, a little problem, solve it, solve it, solve it. You're solving the big problem uh, in the long run. Uh, let's see, what other thing we have in here? Oh yeah, so a couple of comments there. Um, you know, um, target network uh, is pretty important. Um, in practice, in uh, problems such as the Atari games that, you know, when, when this uh, DQN algorithm was introduced, um, uh, they used 10,000 steps at a time. So they froze the network for 10,000 step, then update the weights and then freeze the 10,000 uh, steps and so on. Uh, and I have it right here, right? So uh, Atari games, but you know, you know, for the carpool environment, which is what I use something more simple f uh, for you guys to play around, uh, is 10, 20 times st uh, uh, steps uh, at a time. Okay, and you can play with that value. It actually makes a difference if you put it, you know, too small and so on. But you know, the, the interesting thing about reinforcement learning is that so many values play in, uh, play part that uh, it can it can get confusing uh, confusing to actually uh, understand each of those hyperparameters. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, so I, I guess this you know this is the, the nice equation the the the, cro the, the correct one. Um, you know, this over here. And you can see this is basically the target, uh, and the target uses R plus that, so on. Um, one thing that I, um, let's see. Yeah, one, one uh, kind of clarification that I wanted to make here. Um, uh, because it may confuse people or, you know, it's like an interesting uh, realization is <clears throat> uh, here, allowing the online network to move consistently toward the targets before an update uh, changes the optimization problem. Well, no, just towards the target. It's not quite the targets uh, because what's happening here is that the R plus, you know, gamma, max, uh, A prime, uh, Q, let's see, S prime, A prime, uh, theta, and I'm just copying the function for up from up here. This guy over here, um, uh, you know, the target network. So um, <clears throat> you're not moving just to these guys towards this guy. You're basically helping this signal. Uh, you're giving it time to that signal to enter your function, your online function. This is great, and I hope I don't catch up for. I love it. <laughs> well done. Ah, that's Fede. I know this guy. <laughs> that's S. Excellent. Uh, all right, so yeah, so really what you're doing there is not just the, the targets, you're not going just towards the targets, but you're using the targets with a fixed thing so that the reward can actually enter your function a little bit more. So that bias, uh, which this guy is here, is biased. Uh, that bias uh, here is going to stay constant for a little bit as this, guy's, this guy, which is not biased, it's unbiased, it's just high variance, enters your, well, potentially high variance, uh, enters your, uh, your online uh, value function. Okay. People scratching their heads. How, how are you doing, guys, by the way? Uh, should I, do we, do we like code better? Sorry. I, I promised that you were going to grok this thing, so I, I need to go uh, <laughs> into it. Let's see. Any comp? My goodness. You guys are so quiet. <clears throat> Am I even streaming? All right. Aha. All right. So let's do this one. <laughs> Good. Good to know. All right. So, um, huh. Yeah. 
I hope so. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. So we're going to go into the code. And, and I promise we can show you. I, I want to show you the code, but I feel like sometimes the code is, uh, you know, is the code. If you don't understand what the code says, and there is so many, like, all, like codes, you can get anywhere and get some examples and whatever. It doesn't, that, I don't care about that. That's not, that's not going to give you the tools to move forward, right? So I, I like to spend more time in to kind of help you understand the, the points in here, okay? All right, so the optimized model here. So there are a few things in the code um, that um, actually, uh, let's see, should I first show you how to get the code and then go back to this? Because uh, you, I don't know if, um, I don't know if you have that, uh, let's see. Uh, All right, yeah, I'm gonna do that real quick just to make sure that you guys know where to get it and so on, because I think it's important. Let's see, transition, how do I do that? All right, I guess I need to move this microphone a little bit. Okay. And that guy is showing me, you guys are too bright. Okay, so how do you get the code? Uh, uh, the code is easy to get. Uh, go to github.com, my, uh, how do you call that, tag, I don't know, username, whatever, I have every, like, every single, basically, place, you know, Stack Overflow, uh, GitHub, Twitter, whatever, this guy over here, uh, so if you can see that, hopefully you can see that, uh, yes, you should be able to see it. All right, so you go there, the instructions are here. I highly recommend you get it done. I mean, it's really, really simple. You first clone the repository. You're gonna enter, uh, let's see. Um, there, so once you clone it, uh, let's see. Once you clone it, you get in there, and then here you have the instructions, right? What you're gonna do is simple. I, I, I think this was one of, one of the good things that I did for this book, is I created a Docker image that, um, that you can just pull. Uh, it's gonna have everything in style for you. And I think that's actually very valuable uh, because you don't get to, you don't get to uh, you know, have trouble with, well, I mean, you, you're gonna have to install Docker. That's, that's as much as you do. Other than that, you just pull this guy over here, and that guy is even going to render uh, the agent uh, on the Docker container. It's gonna render the image, and then it's gonna pop it up as a as a GIF, as a uh, like an animation image. Okay, so I think it's actually very valuable. So make sure you do that. Clone that even as we as we are here. Um, and then it's very simple. Uh, so Docker run, uh, IT, da, 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 all this thing over here. And actually, I think, yeah. Laha, I think it was actually who gave me, I think, uh, the Windows. But if not, you know, forgive me. I may have not such a great memory. All right, but, you know, once you do that and you go in there, you're going to see that you run that command, just follow that stuff. Uh, you have the Docker and the notebooks. Notebooks in there, you have all that. Chapter two to 12. Uh, there is a lot of stuff in here. It's, it's really, really, really packed. It's good. Uh, and I, I just, you know, I just hope that you, you know, can use it, uh, enjoy it. Because uh, there's a lot of information in there. When you open the stuff, it's gonna ask you for a password, follow those instructions, uh, GDRL. Uh, and then you can explore uh, the notebooks that are, you know, working that go match uh, the chapters. It's, it's very tightly uh, developed in there, okay? All right, so we're going into the chapter nine no notebook uh, here. Then you just started. I don't know why I created a folder and then a Jupyter notebook. Maybe OCD kicked in. Um, but once you have that, you know, the code should be, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, you should be able to run every single cell top to bottom. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to uh, the optimized model of the, there. Okay, DQN, so the optimized in there. 
Yes. All right. So in from the book, I'm also going to be using the book to kind of highlight the points that are important. Um, target model there. So there is a target model. And then so next states is actually you're passing that into the target model, basically saying, hey, target model, give me the values of this guy, of these next states. What are the values? Uh, you detach it because you these are going to be the targets. It's important that you don't pass gradients through the target model because your training is the online model. Let's say out of curiosity, why do you decide to use PyTorch instead of uh, TensorFlow? Really good question. I actually even uh, threw a, a little kind of, you know, uh, um, how do you call that, poll on Twitter uh, asking for advice. And I did, uh, I evaluated TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, even a, an interesting one that, um, I forget the name right now, uh, but DeepMind has another uh, library that is kind of obscure actually it's not is not people don't know but it's like a front end to uh, tensorflow and PyTorch was to me was much more uh, Pythonic I'm gonna call it and I'm very used to uh, let's see so am I still yeah it's still going Keras I guess Keras so net there you go so net is the one that uh, yeah so net is the one that DeepMind has that is kind of obscure but you know I was like oh that's exciting I'm gonna use that uh, but no, I, um, like I was saying before the buffer and stuff, um, I feel that PyTorch Pi uh, is more friendly if you are familiar with NumPy. And I'm familiar with NumPy. I thought, you know, hey, there's a lot of people that are familiar with NumPy. TensorFlow, before the 2.0 change, which I know they, you know, try to kind of, <laughs> I don't know exactly, I'm not, you know, extremely informed, but they try to basically now get a little bit more like PyTorch. Uh, and you know they kind of you know this graph style, which I think is great for kind of uh, production uh, type of solutions, uh, but for teaching it gets in the way. It gets in the way when you instantiate the graph. What, how do you debug that thing? It's like a completely programming paradigm. Uh, at least when I was evaluating the frameworks, I know that they changed a little bit, and that's perhaps no longer true. Uh, but when I did that, that seemed yeah, that seemed to be. Of course, Annette, yes. Uh, that seemed to be uh, a deal breaker uh, to me. Uh, you know, when you read these things, you kind of understand what's happening just by reading it. I, I don't memorize these things. I'm not a, you know, PyTorch guru at all. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of obvious what's happening here. There's some, you know, couple caveats there, like the max one, like why are you passing the one? Well, that's the axis. And then why are you getting the zero in there? Well, because they pass back a max and then the arg max at the same time, which is a little, con you know, uh, confusing, but it's okay. Uh, other than that, it's good. Anyways, I hope that, that answers that kind of PyTorch TensorFlow debate because I think it's important. Uh, I did, I wanted to use TensorFlow. Um, yeah, I wanted to use TensorFlow uh, to begin with and I didn't even know PyTorch. I hadn't used it myself. And a lot of people recommended, no, no, just go PyTorch, go PyTorch. Uh, and then I tried them both and I was like, yeah, no doubt, PyTorch, 100%. Okay, so optimized model. So what you're gonna see here, what we're doing is we're gonna have this black box that we're gonna train to uh, match, uh, 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 to, uh, what we're trying to do is estimate uh, the optimal value function, all right, or action value function, if I wanna be more uh, precise. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, uh, like you saw in, the, in that equation, and I'm gonna go back real quick to the thing, it's very, very straightforward. Tablet, let's see, transition, boom. Uh -huh. So we're talking about that exact equation there. And I, I'm not gonna make this side by side because I didn't create a scene for that. So I, I think you know it would not be smart for me to do that right now online. Um, all right, but now we go back to the code. So what we're doing there is getting those rewards, R plus gamma times the value of the uh, next state, the max, the value of the of taking the best action or what we think is the best action in the next state. All right. Um, there are a couple of things there, and I'm not going to explain all of them because uh, unfortunately we're not going to have time. But uh, there are a couple of things there that I want you to uh, to see what's happening there. Uh, there is their bootstrapping because I'm using the you know one reward and then the value of the next state. 
there is also off policy learning because I'm using, I'm pretending that I'm gonna take the best action, okay? Uh, to, to grab this guy over here. I'm saying, now I'm gonna take the best, the max action. Just calculate, give me the value of the max. And so I'm gonna calculate the, the value of the current state based on, on me assuming that it, when I land in the next state, I'm just gonna do the best that I can do. But in reality, in reinforcement learning, we do exploration. So that's off policy learning there, okay? So those two things kind of have in your mind, they're happening right there in front of your eyes, okay? <clears throat> and then the other thing that we talked about is the target model, okay? So the target model, uh, again, is gonna be fixed for so many steps and it's gonna be used to uh, estimate that value of the next state here, boom. Uh, so the next state, the detach, then you max, uh, then get the value, unsqueeze it, and squeeze it just puts it in the shape that uh, is being expected so that you can actually do the whole calculations for the entire batch at once. Uh, I'm sure that you guys can, you know, geniuses can uh, get a much better, uh, cleaner code, but, you know, this works fine, good, and it's good enough. All right, so now what we do is we use the max A, and by the way, the names here should be self-explanatory after you go after this a little bit, right? Max A is the max action of QSP, which is S prime, okay, of the next day. Um, and then target QSA is the target of Q with the state and the action. So we're talking about the, the target basically we're using to train the current state. <clears throat> and then QSA is our current estimate. This is what our network, our online network, so check that out. We're talking about the online network thinks that our uh, values should be. And these targets are what we now can estimate our network actually should be. And then so that creates an error, right? So you know that there's a difference there, right? Awesome, that, that makes me happy too, <laughs> the code. Um, that QSA, target QSA, uh, creates the error. And that is called TD error. Um, mostly because it's a TD target, but you know, otherwise just, we can call it the error. After that, we just train the network the regular way, the way that you would any other network. Once you have an error, you just do MSE. Um, uh, and here I'm doing, you know, power of two multiplying by 0 0.5 and then the mean across all those values then optimize, zeroing the, the optimizer so that there are no gradients left over from the previous step, uh, uh, step or from initializing or whatever. Uh, then ba value loss backward, you do the backward pass and then the gradients are gonna stay there. Uh, and then you just do value optimizer step and then your values get, uh, your, your value, your model improves, right? So that is that. That is the uh, section of implementing the target network. Now. Another thing I wanted to mention in this section is the interaction. A lot of people go like, well, should I use for interaction the, the target network or should I use the online network? Uh, we usually just stick to the online uh, model, okay? So it's there, um, you know, feel free to go over this. And then finally, uh, how do we update uh, the uh, the models, like right, so you have the target, and then you have your uh, your online uh, network. You need to get the target back up to speed with the online. All right, so you're gonna bring. You have the online is more more recent, right? So that's the one you're training every step, and then the target is lagging. That's the one that is fixed, and every so often you're gonna update that guy and copy the values then from the online to the target so that the target becomes, again, the online, and then the online keeps going, 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 going. So for that, what we do, uh, this zip function is just basically grabbing two uh, collections and putting them by, side by side so that you can refer to them, you know, sequentially one next to the other, very simple. And then you're saying, okay, so this is the target parameters that correspond to this target, this is the online correspond to this online, and then what you're doing is grab the target, open that, copy the online data. That's it, boom, that's it. You do that for the entire parameters and all of a sudden your networks are identical for that particular step. You immediately uh, collect new experiences, keep training and so on and um, you know your network keeps changing and moving. Okay, <clears throat> let's see what else we have. 
uh, using, okay, so I'm going to go back to the uh, tablet real quick. Uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, so transition. All right, so, <clears throat> okay. So the next thing that we have, uh, seven, so this is the code that we talked about. Okay, so this one is a little bit of a, I was very, oh, I left the microphone. Okay, so probably need this. Okay, there. <clears throat> Um, I'll be honest with you, I wanted to leave this one out of the way kind of thing because it's like a hand wavy type of, uh, uh, not solution even, it's, uh, it's an improvement uh, to make to, to kind of help the non-stationarity issue. But then I thought, you know, you know, you know I've, I've, I've read it, I heard it, um, uh, I've, you know, implemented it myself and, I, and yes, you know, larger networks have, have a be do a better job at this. Um, but I encourage you to, um, you know, prove me right or wrong and just like play with a notebook and, uh, just, you know, I, I'm sure you can create a good experiment that, you know, kind of highlights this, whether this is actually a thing or just a fantasy. But, uh, that being said, um, I wanted to explain it here. Okay. And, and in, in the book as well. So what's going to happen is, you know, that smaller networks, um, are going to use the weights that it has, right, to kind of come up with uh, relevant traits that, uh, you know, uh, make things similar, right? So you, what you're trying to do is generalize, right, when you do supervised learning. What your network is supposed to do is to look at a bunch of pictures of cats so that when it looks at pictures of cats that's never seen before, it can actually say, ah, oh, that's a cat, I know it, okay? So the same thing happens here, right? So you're training the network to do that. But the problem is when you are, when you train a very small network, uh, chances are that uh, you're going to, um, say, confuse, per perhaps not the right word, but uh, bear with me. You're going to confuse two things for the same thing. You're going to say, oh, this, you know, um, in, in reinforcement learning is called um, aliasing, right? So let me highlight there. I don't know uh, that. Uh, so here. Yeah, so he, this, I think this is a point. Yeah, this is a good point here. Yeah, so with more powerful networks, you are able to uh, understand the, or the network is able to uh, see the subtle differences that you would not otherwise. So do you use reinforcement learning at your current job? Yes, sir, I do. I do. And it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> It's fun, but I can't, I can't talk too much about it, but uh, it's absolutely great. And people hate me for that, and I love people for that. So it's all good. We are all in love and peace. <laughs> all right, so keep going here. Uh, all right, so so with more powerful networks, you can see the subtle differences between the states, and, and then so it's, it's easier for the network to look at those little differences and say, aha. So what is going to happen here is that, all right, so let's see. Uh, let's see, I'll see it in a perfect correlation. Yeah. So the hope, okay, by this using larger networks, it, networks is that two states that are correlated, because the problem is that the two states that are correlated look like the same and they change and then everything changes basically, right? So sequentially things continue to change as you improve that. Uh, the hope is that a larger network would not uh, too quickly overfit to overfit, oh, why did I use that word? But anyway, overfit to that particular sample and it will be able to actually see the differences in the samples um, um, in, a, in, a, um, in a better uh, way, more robust. Um, okay, so, you know, try to read this, no, uh, here. Try to read this paragraph over here. Uh, so yeah, by alias in here, I mean that the fact that the states look alike uh, and you know there are I think later in the in the book actually chapter uh, I think it's 11 I actually go into some detail as to you know what do I mean by Alicine and I even give a little example that can, that's kind of cute and so on uh, let's see all right all right so uh, boil it down ways to mitigate uh, the fact that targets in reinforcement learning are stationary yeah, so here's like a little summary when I, you know, you kind of, you got to enjoy this kind of like cute icons and stuff. Uh, but, you know, hopefully you read the, the text inside. 
Uh, and this is basically a summary of this, you know, few minutes that we've been going through this. Wow, one hour. All right, we're gonna keep going for a little bit at least, because uh, I, I wanted to finish uh, DQN. I would not just stop uh, call. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay, we kind of rewind all the way to the beginning. And um, remember, we're talking about DQN. DQN, an algorithm that is trying to make the supervised learning problem seem more like, uh, I'm sorry, the reinforcement learning problem seem more like the supervised learning problem so that the methods, you know, the, the deep neural networks can be trained uh, more easily. And we talked about the two things, one, the stationarity of the targets, which we solve by using the target networks. And the second thing is that the data is not IID, independent and identically distributed, okay? So you remember when the pictures of the cat we have in there, when we get a data set, usually we just, we just grab it. Uh, first of all, it's, station, it's also, uh, um, uh, ident so it's, you have the same data set. I don't wanna reuse words that don't fit in there or that I shouldn't. You have the data set there. Uh, you shuffle it and you know you you collect samples and you use those samples uh, to train the network. In online learning, the way that we can handle this, and, and here I'm, I'm talking about an FQ, which is the algorithm that I talked about in the previous chapter, but I think we confuse things a little bit. Uh, so let me see where I can fast forward. So the experience is, so okay. Here, let we just go back to the solution. The solution to making the data look more IID, independent and identically distributed, is, is to use what, uh, what is called a replay buffer or a replay memory. So the, the, the process of experience replay uh, consists of a data structure which is often referred to as the replay buffer or a replay memory or, you know, very similar uh, definitions, uh, but commonly used. This replay buffer, what it's going to do is going to hold experience samples for several steps. Um, much more than it's probably not relevant. Here and allowing the sampling of mini batches from a broad set of past experiences. So this is the key here. So having a replay buffer, so I'm continuing to read, has two critical things. First, the training process can use a more diverse mini batch for performing updates. So, so remember now, so if we have a huge replay buffer and we're collecting samples, let's say we have a million samples in there, you know, chances are that there are multiple policies that have been adding samples in there for multi multiple conditions, right? So the experience set, the entire thing is more like a data set how you would get it, you know, a bunch of ImageNet or whatever. You get uh, all the pictures at once uh, of all of the things that the agent is going to ever see, right? So you have the whole set. It's much easier for you to... Uh, for your agent to use that uh, and learn from the from that broad set, um, and then the second well, this is more related. The second thing here is actually related to NFQ, which I didn't explain, so I'm not gonna uh, give that detail. But let's see. I don't know how a superior uh, replay buffer uses slow. Okay, we're gonna get into more detail, but <clears throat> yeah, a little here, a uh, history bit. Uh, can you believe that this uh, experience replay is actually introduced in a 1992 paper? Uh, it's kind of crazy, you know, when you think about it, deep reinforcement learning, yeah. If we don't call it deep, we don't pay attention, but in reality, many of these things are actually, you know, things that, um, you know, have been researching, going on and so on for, for quite some time, which is, you know, kind of cool. Uh, let's see. All right, so. My cheat sheet. Oh, using a real, I need to fast forward a little bit. All right, so using a replay buffer is a good impression. So, yeah, that's the key right there. So, 
Well, that's the key right there. Okay, so I, I wanted to see it here in this picture. So this is the, the DQN with a replay buffer. No, notice that I'm not saying, and a target network because that would make a mess in the whole uh, drawing, but it's only like, you know, this is, this is how it would be with the, with the replay buffer. What happens here? So I'm gonna call this kind of, you know, like the interaction, uh, you know, starts here. The agent selects an action. Well, actually, actually the proper way to start this whole thing is, uh, is this way. Uh, with an observation uh, so yeah so the agent is able to observe the world right um, uh, then takes an action and next collects that experience of taking an action and then have another reward uh, that experience actually is going to come into the replay buffer so it's going to get stored here right let's see and then you know uh, you know you use the pr this one and a new one right with the action to collect it and put it here and then you use a new one and you get the point what I'm doing here you use this one and a new one and then you put it here right uh, well actually in reality you pull all this sequentially but you get my point so you actually put it one next to the other if you're doing sequentially you're just adding a sequentially what you do do uh, though is to uh, sample it uniformly at random and this kind of gets a lot of people because uh, when I implemented this myself too, one, one of my first ideas, I, I, you know, when I read uh, the paper and I was like, oh, they're so silly. You can, you can just sample the, the highest reward so that the agent lets their higher, learns the highest reward. That's the, the way to do it. Let's do it that way. And yeah, it didn't work and it doesn't work. So <laughs> uh, uh, I actually explain a little bit more, you know, in the, uh, what is it? Actually the following chapter, prioritize experience replay. Um, but uh, again, I give some intuition, but, but you know, for now, it's just like th what the way you want to sample it in this case is uh, at random, uniformly at random, just sample from the entire bu buffer at once, right? You create a little mini batch. Where is it? Yeah. You create a little mini batch. Um, a mini batch, and then you use that to train your function, right? Uh, and then from those Q values, you, you know, pass it through an exploration strategy, usually, you know, epsilon greedy and so on. Yeah, super excited too. Um, all right, uh, epsilon greedy strategy and so on, and then, you know, select the action and keep going like that, boom, boom, boom. That's, that's really what the replay buffer is. It's not really anything out of this world, but, but I want you to see it, to visualize, to uh, kind of capture what the replay buffer is really doing for us, right? So what you're doing is you have this data coming sequentially online, all this stream of data, and you put it in the buffer. And then one day, one night, you all of a sudden just lay down in your bed and start thinking about what happened yesterday and what happened the day before and so on. And you use that thing and you pass it through your brain and go like, yeah, I should have done it this way. I should have done that. I should do this this way and so on, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's really the replay buffer. It's like a whole you know collection of memories, right, that you can use for training in a way that the data now looks that is independent because, you know, in reality, these guys are kind of correlated, but you know, the guy over here and the guy, the another guy over here and so on are not. So once you pull those guys, that are, those are independent for the most part uh, and, you know, identically distributed because if it's large enough, the buffer is large enough, then you're gonna have like basically experiences of since you know like oh when i was a kid this i did this and this happened and so on but also when i was teenager this and this happened and you know for the entire history of the agent right you know good or 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 or, or better um that's what you do all right so cool uh one little comment here uh, before we flip to the notebook and then wrap it up for tonight is that you know the, the implementation that is on my um, in my notebook is for um, first of all not compatible with images. I let you do that, and I think it's actually a good exercise. Uh, but also, if your replay buffer needs to be very very large, you're gonna have you're gonna need a different data structure. Okay, and there are other ways there are ways to do that, but I just didn't want to pollute uh, the teaching of the of the of the components with implementation details to make you know to get better performance out of the components 
All right, so the, the better performance out of the components, I recommend you go to OpenAI. They have a, an implementation of replay buffer. I actually, first, before that, I, I highly encourage you to try to implement it uh, yourself or try to implement a very efficient version yourself. Uh, then look at what they're using. They're using a very specific data structure that helps you uh, insert data and, all, and so on. I want you to keep in, in your head one thing is like uh, for things such as Atari, for instance, uh, you have a stack of four most recent images. Uh, usually those are 84 by 84. So 84 by 84 uh, by four, that is a lot of information in there for one. So if you keep in, in Atari, they usually recommend a million. So here, and if you do, don't do a million, sometimes it doesn't work depending on the game, but it doesn't work really well. That's a lot of data. Okay, so your computer doesn't have that capacity. So there are ways, or you know, even if it does, it just makes no sense to, to use it. I don't think it has it. Uh, it has that capacity. One thing you can do is this, this you know, things are correlated, so you can create like uh, more efficient data structures that instead of actually having the data, have the data that is, you know, that different uh, experience samples have and so on. There are many tricks that you can uh, implement there to make all this better. But just a heads up that, uh, you know, it, it is it is another kind of, you know, another chapter <laughs> uh, to go into the details. I, I don't like when people just plop code and say, like, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, so just to give you that heads up. All right, so let's see. Uh, I think I'm wrapping up soon. Replay, buffer, grading update. Okay, so I, I, throughout the book I did this because I mostly, I'm you know, I'm not a math expert, uh, but I like uh, people to kind of get familiar with it. Uh, because I feel that is so important for a field like uh, like a reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, that you need to kind of open up to you know the equations and kind of read them, be be able to understand it. So I try what I try to do is kind of you know write the equation the the best way I thought uh, for that particular case, and then kind of give you a little bit of a um, uh, you know comments uh, on each of the equations and the things that I want you to see right. So the main thing to see here in this one, for instance, is, you know, uh, on the previous one, we had the difference between the uh, target, let's see here. Yeah, so we have the difference between, between these two, the main difference is this. This represents the neural network weights, okay? Here you can see that it has an I the I basically is following the every time step type of thing. And actually time step, I mean iteration. So every time that you improve the network, which in this particular algorithm, I and T, which is a time, or actually, yeah, t and T would be basically the same in, in terms of, you know, the entire set of episodes. Let me not confuse them too much in there. Uh, but then this one is the change in there. That, you know, theta with a little sign up there is basically saying that is the frozen network. So that that's the little thing I want you to see there. That guy over there is using a network that is uh, static for some time. That's that kind of like what they use. Now here, I'm using online experiences, right? To make it a little confusing. But here I try to clarify it <laughs> when the full equation comes up. And then here from that same function, uh, equation, sorry, um, using the target uh, weights uh, and the online experiences, now I continue to use that, but now I use the replay buffer. And the replay buffer, basically the same thing, D, I mean, it's very simple, D is the data set, uh, U is the how you sample this thing uniformly at random, that function, you sample, this squiggle thing is sampling, and then you get the, the samples that you're going to use for training this thing. Okay, so it's very simple in there, and this is the last part. I simply replay both. There you go. All right, so boil it down, and here I kind of explain it. Uh, you know, very very technique. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the the technique is very simple. It's been around for decades. As your agent collects experience topple blah online. This is the what's called the experience topple. Usually, you know, here you actually have also a. A D, but I don't want to get into the details for that. Uh, online, you insert into the data structure commonly referred to as a replay buffer D, and such as D has all that experience, and M is the size of the replay buffer, and the value is usually between 10,000 
on a million, depending on the problem, of course. Uh, and then we train the agent on the mini batch of sample uniformly at random, usually uniformly at random, uh, from the buffer. Um, so that each of the experience samples has the same probability, equal probability uh, of being selected. Okay, and now we can switch to the code to look at that real quick. And then we wrap up uh, for today. I don't know who's brave souls that stay with me all this time, but uh, thanks for that. Let's see. All right, so um, screen transition. There you go. And I need to move this guy, I suppose. Okay. All right, so again, the replay buffer, not the best implementation in the world, but it should be very straightforward. That might purpose was to make it easy for you to read, to understand, and to go like, aha, I know what he's doing here. Not for me to say, oh, look at my code, it's so cute. All right, so um, the replay buffer right there is very simple. I'm creating an empty NumPy array. I don't want to complicate things too much. An empty NumPy array that has a max size preset, and I do it empty and not a pen and stuff like that to make it a little faster could just collect that memory, put it in there, and then just use the memory uh, <clears throat> from the get-go, but it consumes more memory, okay? So just have that in mind. Um, yeah, so you have that in there. Let's see what else. I have notes in here. Uh, okay, so that's fine. So some variables there. Here, max size is, you know, the maximum size that you want the buffer to be, but the buffer is obviously at the beginning when it's being filled, has so many... Uh, samples and then it keeps continuous 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 boom, 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 until it hits that max and then you keep the max uh, so it doesn't go beyond what we do normally is evict the old ones so the old samples just get out just one at a time no you know special way just fill up that buffer and then sample uniformly around them it's a simple way um yeah so in the let's see so the store function, I'm getting a sample variable, which basically has the different things. In this case, I'm gonna have a state, an action, a reward, p is prime, state prime, uh, so p um, storage, and then uh, d, which is gonna be the done, which we use for training. Um, we insert them in the buffer. What I'm doing is this self idx is actually keeping the index uh, where we need to actually put that value. Uh, the index is going to go up, 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 and then it's going to go, um, look at this, actually, yeah, uh, uh, max size, so I'm actually going back and overriding the whole thing, oh, that makes sense, yeah, so over overriding, so here's the buffer, let's see, why am I recording, yeah, here's the buffer, I go boom, 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 and then go back to the beginning, boom, 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 boom. so every, every single sample stays like that. <laughs> it's good it's good it's fun uh yeah no i'm still working too so no worries man <laughs> it's a lot of fun though uh then yeah there there it is so that's okay so that's the id the size what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the size until it hits the max and once in the max you pick the min between the max and the size and just basically gonna keep the the max size so it's uh it you know it, it basically size is not gonna grow there the only thing i'm doing that for is so that i can actually ask the question like what's the size uh, of my thing right now and it's not the ID because the ID remember it just goes back to the bottom so there are many ways that you can implement this thing this is the way that I thought it was the easiest to read so you can go top to bottom and read the, the things very simply um, and then so the sample function is basically like I said it's a, a random choice uh, the probabilities are going to be um, basically you know random choice is gonna be uniformly if you don't pass a P I suppose uh, I'm sure because I implemented this. Let's see, size, batch, and replace. Um, and then so the without replacement, get the IDs, then uh, index the memories. So you're gonna get the different samples and the different um, memory buffers for each one. Uh, VStack, a vertical stack, so that you can actually now do the, the equations for the entire mini batch and then pass that experience back uh, to the training process. And that's it. And that's your replay buffer for you. Um, you know, once we run this thing, 
and it's actually it should be really really uh, nice to run um, So yeah, so you can see they're running. Um, you know, to me it's kind of funny because, um, you know, when you read some people having trouble with the carpal and you go like, uh, no, you should not have trouble with the carpal. And then they go like, yeah, you know, I have trouble with carpal because reinforcement learning is really hard to train. And you know, it's because of this. And you're like, no, it is not. You should be able to train carpal without a problem. So I say, just go ahead and implement, like use my notebook and you'll see that uh, it shouldn't be that terribly hard uh, to train and not just also not the 200 step carpal the 500 step uh, I highly recommend you do that and yeah after you you know finalize that training which shouldn't take a couple minutes uh, you basically can render uh, the DQN agent progression in this case episode zero this is when it's training right so you can see here tipping over pretty quickly right and then the episode 62 it's actually learning to kind of stay a little bit, but you know, goes off the screen, which is also a terminal state. And then episode 125 gets a little bit better. Uh, 188 gets pretty good. And then 255 is like, this is a piece of cake, I'm good. And then I'm also demoing the fully trained agent for a couple of times, so you can see the fully trained agent, how it is uh, doing. And you can see it's just, you know, it, it's bored. It doesn't, It's this is easy. So what I, uh, my challenge to you is go ahead and use this to uh, train a different environment. You can use either the same notebooks. Uh, you know, you will have to perhaps, uh, you know, use some other environment that is uh, already installed uh, in that uh, uh, Docker container. Or just use the algorithm and, you know, uh, train it in, in a separate notebook, but share it with me because I I think that, the, uh, again, the to me, one thing in learning, the, the the best thing that I can do for you, and I transition to that camera. All right, so the best thing that I can do for you is really motivate you and kind of explain you a little bit, kind of a little bit at a time. But the learning really happens when you take over, when you say, like, okay, I'm going to try it now myself. So I encourage you to try it out, to try something out, to, uh, you know, do something full. Doesn't matter. Share it. I share it with the world as well. I think uh, that's that's uh, really what we need more uh, of in this world. So, yeah, I don't know if there are any questions. I see that we only have what what do we have? Sixteen left. So people are still hanging in there. That's good. <laughs> any comments, guys? Before I say goodbye and then wrap it up. Joseph is good, man. Is is awesome. No, I, I hope you enjoy the book, I, and thank you for supporting me. It's, it's great. Fede, awesome. More please. Yeah, I'll think about that. You know, I have to go from, like, zero to <laughs> to explain a little bit more because I think there's so much good information here that, that, that we should, uh, you know, get people also to, you know, to get into, get excited about it. Okay. Well, with that, then, uh, I guess I'll see you around. So... Uh, first of all, and you know, like I, I'm sorry, first of all, I mean, I want to repeat one thing is thank you so much for your support. I really, it meant the world to me. Uh, and the book is about to get released, uh, released. So you're going to love it. I think, I hope so, you know, so, uh, you're going to like it. Let me know if you do, uh, and let me know if you don't too, cause I learned from that, you know, just like any other agent. All right, guys, take care and uh, stay safe too. Look at my hair, growing, growing long. This is the COVID hair. <laughs> uh, take care.